crazy it's rice krispies okay you know it's gonna taste good you might add a little bit of bananas a little bit of honey you know a little bit of sugar and we got rice krispies but i mean it's not cinnamon toast crunch if you have unlimited funds the cars that you can buy are pretty much whatever your imagination you may be sleeping in the bed and wake up and say yo you know what i want i want a twin turbo 16 cylinder with four electric motors i bet you somebody got it Hey, you like cars? Well, so do I. Take a seat real quick. You're listening to Car Quicks. Welcome back. You know what time it is. It's Car Quicks podcast time. And you know what episode we're on. Let me get my things together. Episode 30, Car Quicks, season one. I'm back at it again. How y'all doing out there? I just came back from a business trip in another state, but I'm here now to report on the car news and, you know, a couple things that are going on with my vehicle and ideas I got that have been just brewing in my head. So let's just jump to it. Let's get right into the meat and potatoes. So it's been probably a number of times on this podcast where I've talked about Porsche because they really they've been on a run they've been on a run their aftermarket you know modifiers connoisseurs singer Gunther works I mean they have been pumping now Porsches left and right so the other day in lieu of all of the regulations that Porsche says they have to abide by with the FIA when it comes to their 911 GT3R, they basically rolled out something that doesn't play by any of the rules. And you see it above me. It's called the Rent Sport. The 911 GTR, GT3R Rent Sport. And this looks ridiculous, okay? I mean... I don't even, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. If you have unlimited funds, the cars that you can buy are pretty much whatever your imagination. You may be sleeping in the bed and wake up and say, yo, you know what I want? I want a twin turbo 16 cylinder with four electric motors. I bet you somebody got it. Somebody got it. Somebody sitting out there right now on the drawing pad writing up something called the, I don't know what, the 9000 XYZR, whatever it may be, but back to Porsche. So they made the Ren Sport. This is based off of an older vehicle from the early, what, 80s called the 935 77. Now, if you're looking at this picture and you remember a couple podcasts before, I was speaking about something that Singer had done on the same car because if you look at the rear of this car now if you're on an audio version of this you're probably like i don't see no pictures but on the rear of this 911 it's a massive wing now the one the singer did same thing massive squared off wing it looks looks fire i love it big wing gang as i said before so this one the same thing so porsche basically took the same idea and added to a basically a track only car now this weighs 2734 pounds Red lines at 9,400 RPMs, 611 horsepower out of a 4.2 liter. It costs $1,046,000. Again, if you win the Powerball, guess what? We got you on the ridiculous vehicles that you can only drive on the track. Now, I will say this. I love when manufacturers do do this, but there is a bit of kind of like unobtainium where it's like we can see it on the paper. We can see it on the articles. I could talk about it on the podcast, but realistically, most of us already know we're never going to see one of these because either you got to be at a very specific track where some owner brings theirs or you got to go to a Porsche event like when they revealed this. Get your pictures, get your videos, talk about it, and then that's it. Pretty much we go away and we may never hear about it again. Here's what I would like, because there's a number of cars that are like this, right? This is not the only one that is track only, only made for a very select few of the most elite clientele. McLaren has a 
Solos or the Solus, S-O-L-U-S. It's another hyper car that only is for the track. Ferrari's done it with the FXX, but the new one for the SF90 is now street legal, but previously they've done it before. Aston Martin has the Valkyrie, which they have a road legal one, but they also have a track only one, equally in the same range as these million dollar cars. What they should do is they should bring all these owners together or let the owners hire a driver that they want and have at it on the track. It doesn't got to be car to car, door to door, even though that would look really cool because there's a, you know, fear of crashing the car and anybody that owns these is going to be like, I don't want nobody damaging my car. But let's do a time attack. Let's just put these on a track. Circuit of Americas, Yaz Marina, you know, VIR, so anywhere. It could be Laguna Seca. Throw them on the track, get the timer out, get the ill drone footage, get the production, call Motor Trend, Road and Track, call whoever. Get them on the track and just get some hard numbers. Now, given that I know that most of these manufacturers have an ego, Porsche is not probably going to want to see McLaren dusting them on the track and vice versa. And Ferrari probably is not showing up at all because they're like, we don't got to do none of that. We are Ferrari. That's what they're going to say. Okay, they're not even going to entertain being put into any type of competitive nature for their road legal base car, so to speak, not an F1 or stuff like that where they are competing. But I think it would be really cool to see them get on the track, put all these cars to their paces, because, I mean, we're never, like I said, I'm never going to see this thing. And anybody that does buy it, I can't imagine that they're just going to be at the local cars and coffee pulling up like, hey, guys, check this out. You may get a few of those in California where I live. I mean, you don't get too many people pulling out the most insane exotics. That being a track only car, you probably have to do it in a state that's a little bit more lenient when it comes to rules of cars on the road. I mean, where I live is definitely not like California. So we probably can pull it off where a cops will just be like, hey, that's really dope. You know, salute. Put it back in the garage and you're done. <laughs> so, Porsche's making another crazy car. It's not the Mission X that I showed you probably a couple episodes ago that looks insane. That's clearly a 918 Spider replacement. They haven't talked about that. But listen, Porsche, like I said, they've been on a run. We have been seeing multiple cars from everybody. Their aftermarket teams, their in house teams, it's been going on and on. So, you win the Powerball, guess what you can do for the track? <laughs> now, coming down to a more pedestrian level, you know, back to reality. Honda is now officially showing out all the details of their first electric SUV. Now, granted, there are going to be people that see this thing, the prologue. I personally like how it looks. Finally, for once, one of these SUVs has some type of it still has rounded corners, but it's still kind of square. You see it floating on the screen. It has wide and fin. It has a nice muscular stance, so I'm not mad at when Honda's done here. It is in collaboration with General Motors. Now, that's probably where a lot of the Honda diehards are going to check out and say, yo, car quicks. It's been real. Thank you. Salute. Call me when Honda makes it all in-house. And I, I get it. I get it. Though I think we have some leeway when it comes to electric cars and manufacturers that maybe in the past didn't have the greatest track record on certain vehicles and drivetrains and powertrains and all that. So electric cars eliminates all of the issues of being a manufacturer that can make a really good motor. Electric motors are kind of just... To me, they're all parts of it. There's a main manufacturer that's making these electric motors and batteries, and we're stuffing them in cars, and the outside version of it or the way we tweak the suspension and the interior and how it reacts to accelerating and deceleration, that is all by the manufacturer. But ultimately, the core of all these electric cars, you're going to start noticing they're getting pulled from the same distributor, so to speak. Until we get deep into the weeds of electric cars, most manufacturers aren't going to start building stuff in-house. They may be working on it, but most of the debuts, they're just pulling parts. We just got to get the ball rolling. So the Honda Prelude, Prelude, Pro, Prologue, I say Prelude. <laughs> there was a Honda Prelude, just not this one. The Prologue is a 300-mile range, $40,000 electric SUV. 
40,000 starting on the low end. Honestly, this is probably going to be at 50. And I know, listen, the price tags for these electric cars is really, is just really something we all got to just accept. I mean, 40,000 is a starting point on almost all cars. I told you before, the cheapest brand new car in Mirage is now Mirage. Okay, it's out of here. As far as SUVs in the electric range, I mean, I can't imagine you're going to get anything much cheaper unless you're talking about really simplified, right? No extra accoutrements, no extra leathers and wireless charging and all these things, even though those things are cheap. So I'm not really talking about something really crazy, but most manufacturers are going to start in this range. 30 probably being the absolute lowest. So 40 is where it starts. There's two powertrains. We have a single motor, front wheel drive, dual motor, all wheel drive. Horsepower range in this kind of quote unquote electric one. For the single motor, you're looking at 210. For the dual, we're looking at 288. Interior wise, it's not unattractive. It's typical Honda. And it's kind of, Honda's really, really good. And let me just say this is kind of contra this is kind of like a I'm kind of contradicting myself in a way, right? Honda back in the day, in the current time now, if you pull an old CB7 Honda Accord from the 90s, we love the simplicity of the interior. When we get into these older Toyotas and Hondas and Fords and things like that, OBS, F-150s, we love the simplicity of the interior. So on the flip side of what I'm about to say is when these manufacturers see or probably hear people saying there's too many screens, there's too many buttons, there's too many distractions on the dashboard. They simplify it. But then, unfortunately, we check the price tag and we're like 50000 Open the front door. See the front door, we're like, hey, uh, black and gray, a little bit of soft touch plastic, one little stairwell slapped on screen on the center console. I, they, it ain't that a fire no more. See, the screens on the dashboard is kind of becoming a thing where people are like, there's no thought put and put into the design of the cars and where these screens go. I agree with that. My GR Corolla has a little screen that's just attached to the front of the dashboard. Is it in the greatest spot? No. Could they have integrated it somehow, some way? I argue yes. I argue that give me a bigger instrument cluster. I don't even need anything in the center. The center isn't for anybody but the driver, really. I mean, the passenger isn't looking at it. The driver is the one checking it. Navigation is for the driver. You can stuff all this in the center in the instrument cluster, even if you got to make it a little bit bigger. I have a little 8-inch screen. We can make that happen in the instrument cluster. So for the prologue, it's typical Honda. It looks good. And what I mean by looks good is that it's not abrasive. It's not unattractive. It just is very kind. It's like plain good. It's nothing crazy. It's Rice Krispies, okay? You know it's going to taste good. You might add a little bit of bananas, a little bit of honey, you know, a little bit of sugar, and we got Rice Krispies. But, I mean, it's not Cinnamon Toast Crunch, okay? So that's what I mean. We're not at the level of interior for that. But this isn't probably what that's for. I would imagine that when there is a higher trim level EX, EXL, whatever they decide to add, maybe there's Honda performance parts that they're going to try to spice up the interior. But... We kind of go back and forth, right? I do like how it is simple. I do understand that the price of it kind of makes you kind of scratch your head a bit and say, I don't really know if that's enough for the price. Now, if we go back, like I said, we go back in the day when Hondas and, you know, CRVs and Honda Pilots were under 30, then it all makes sense. And we appreciate it now even more because sometimes some of the newer cars in a push for them to feel exciting, they throw a bunch of dumb junk in the interior. Where there's extra LED lightings, where there's gigantic screens that wrap around you like I'm in an IMAX theater, whatever it may be, sometimes some of these new ideas don't really play well to the overall of the car. But what I will give Honda's praise is that for this interior and this exterior, they are landing right in line with who they are. This looks like the Honda Accord. It looks like the Honda Civic. It looks like the Civic Type R. I mean, all the interiors kind of have a very nice lineage. It probably makes it a lot easier to find parts for it later. It's definitely cheaper for them to build the cars like this. So that is what we have. Now, later on down the road, Honda will be building more in-house when it comes to their electric drivetrain. This one is based off GM's, what's it called? Ultium? Ultium. 
ULT. IUM, OTM platform, I think it's used on the Equinox, EV, it's used in a number of places. How this will work going forward? Will it have the Honda reliability? Will people buy it, hear about the GM? Will they be scoffed at it and be like, I'm not buying that, call me when it's all Honda? I think they'll still buy it. Most people that are walking to a Honda dealership won't even really ask that question. Most salespeople will know not to start talking about General Motors and the Honda dealership because they know that'll backfire on their sale probably. So most people probably won't even know. And honestly, I wouldn't even care either. Listen, as we move forward, these companies will start putting their stuff in place and we will get the full Japanese Honda electric car. It'll come. Now, back, jumping back into the realm of unobtainium, Aston Martin has shown off that they had yet another wild car in the tuck. They had the Valkyrie. They've had, you know, other Aston Martins, you know, Vantage, Vanquishes and that. They have the Valhalla. Yeah, it looks crazy. Look on the screen. Now, I know you probably wonder, why you sound so unexcited? Now, I'll say this. The Valkyrie is absolutely bonkers. So that's probably why I'm like, Aston Martin's making another super hypercar. This one is kind of in traditional sense. You see the doors that kind of come up in the air, butterfly doors, $800,000, 998 horsepower, three electric motor V8 beast. This is part of the course. You already know. Look at the interior. We got Alcantara. It looks ridiculous. This is Aston. The interior is going to look fire. Alcantara, carbon fiber, carbon fiber monocoque, molded seats to the driver and the passenger, dashboard is a race car, basically. We know what this looks like. Now, obviously, for me, I'm kind of like, I don't even know they had this in conjunction with the Valkyrie, but the Valkyrie, as I've come to find out, is like the halo halo. That is the top of the top. The Valhalla comes under that, and then they have obviously the other ones under that. I don't know when it's coming out. It has been worked on with the help of renowned F1 driver, Fernando Alonso. So you already know that it's going to perform and it's going to drive. What is it going to look like? You see it. When is it going to be available? I don't know. It's $800,000. Call it a cool million when you're done. Because when you add options, because you can't just get a Valhalla from Aston Martin and just say, give me the base one. You got to get the certain colors. Maybe you want the green with the bronze wheels. Maybe you want the interior to have like forest British green, Alcantara and carbon. I mean, you can probably go crazy. So I would imagine any of these that are coming out are going to be somewhere between 1.4 and 1.6, honestly. When people are really done getting into their bag, let me not say 1.4. Let me say 1.2. 1.2 1.2 to 1.5. That's probably what they're going to cost. 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars is what's going to get you a properly specced Valhalla. Now, outside of the other news, that was pretty much it. Now, we're going to talk about some other news. We got Forza Motorsports about to drop. I want you guys to understand, I may be MIA come October 10th. Some of these podcasts may be a bit delayed because Forza Motorsports on an Xbox Series X drops, and I'm diving in, okay? I'm going to the wall and back. I'm going crazy. I'm going to be playing that. I have been playing Gran Turismo. I know this is kind of shifting into like a video game podcast, but listen, I can do that too. And shout out to the video game podcast because you're going to hear my face and my voice on another podcast that I used to run many years ago with a good friend of mine. It's coming back. It's called tech, etc. So get ready. Don't think I don't know only about cars. Okay, my career is in tech. I can dive into the microchips and microprocessors of this world and geek out with the best of them. And I shall. Now, back to the cars. There is one of 100 Toyota MR2 convertibles up for sale. And this is probably one of the few times I completely forgot that there was an MR2 convertible. I completely forgot. But somebody threw one up for sale. I don't know what it's going to cost. I can't imagine it's going to be the cheapest thing in the world because you're talking about all these 90s JDM cars. We're coming to we're we're done. Listen, I wanted a 240 again. I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, car quicks, you ain't got the time and you ain't got the money to be giving these people who think they got something worthwhile that's been drifted into walls and trees. 
So any of the 90s cars that we loved, they got kind of a, an askew price tag. Really, it's an emotional thing. There's no reality to the price. If they say this MR2 Spider cost $50,000, that's just what it costs. Was it worth that much when it came out? Probably not. It probably was a lot you know, cheaper. But given the fact that there was only less than 100 of these ever made, then you can pretty much gather that anybody that really is interested in buying an MR2 Spider is going to cough up whatever amount of money it costs to get the job done. Outside of the MR2 Spider, there is also... What other news is there? Oh, almost, I almost, I almost forgot. So here's the news that also is coming out. The Cybertruck is on its way, right? It's, <laughs> it's somewhere in between vaporware and obtainware. Uh, obtainware. Okay, I made up a word. Okay, rock with me, please. Riv Rivian has had their electric truck out. So, you know, the CEO's running around talking about, I don't think any of the people are going to defect to a cyber truck in lieu of a R1T or anything Rivian has to, to sell. I will say this, the cyber truck, it looks ridiculous, but I think that is what is going to draw a lot more people than we suspect to the truck because it looks ridiculous because everything else looks so normal. It looks so regular. Like I said, a lot of the electric cars are eggs on wheels. A lot of the electric SUVs look the similar the same. So when you get an electric truck, not that the Rivian looks like anything out there because it doesn't, but it's, you know, rounded corners. You see the cyber truck and it looks like it was a trapezoid three weeks ago with got wheels thrown onto it. This looks like it connects, you know, little toys you used to put together. That's what this looks like. So anybody that's interested in an electric truck, you look at these two together and you're probably going to lean towards maybe the more in your face to a degree. People that like polarizing things, they like to look at something kind of exciting. I would like to see the Cybertruck in another color. I suspect that if it was painted a true color, not the aluminum that you see one running around like black, maybe even in white, silver, you know, a blue color, green, even a yellow. I think once we get true color on it or when somebody takes one and inevitably wraps it or something, it'll start looking better. So the Cybertruck is somewhere eventually about to show up. In other news about trucks that are soon to come out, the Land Cruiser got re reintroduced from Toyota. But during that phase of that introduction, they showed a silhouette of a smaller truck that everybody is saying is a return of the FJ Cruiser. Now, if Toyota decides to make a small, I guess it would be two doors. I would it would have to be two doors because the FJ Cruiser is two doors. If they make it four door, it's boxy, and we got the Forerunner, and we have a Land Cruiser, and we got to ask the question of what's the point of the small version of this thing. I suspect it'll be a two door. If it's manual, if it runs a tur turbo four cylinder from them, even if it's hybrid, I suspect that we will have a bankroll in the dealerships when it comes to this if it comes out i have the silhouette on the screen i can't tell what it may look like i can tell that if toyota on the run that they are on as far as making cars that talk to a very niche group of people like my gr corolla that talks to a group of people like the land cruisers and stuff i suspect that this will eventually come out and they will make it for those people it will probably cost They'll probably say it starts at $38,000. You go to the dealership, they're going to laugh you at the door and say it's $48,000. Okay, so be prepared. Now, speak, going, speaking about Toyotas, my GR Corolla. It is wonderful. I always say it's wonderful. I did a you know review on it, 15,000 miles, so on and so forth. I'm at 16,000 now. And I'm waiting for after SEMA and after Tokyo Auto Salon because it's time to get this cracking. I need exhaust. I need down pipes. I need mid pipes. I really need wheels and suspension. So Toyota announced that they're releasing some GR Gazoo Racing OEM springs and shocks 
they're about as much as coilovers. So there's going to be a school of camp that says, I'm buying coilovers. I'm not spending $1,300 on OEM springs and shocks. And there's a side of them that say, OEM, you know, it's been tr tested. You know, they already went through the paces for it. It won't void no warranty for a suspension. I'm going to throw it on. So I'm kind of in the middle on deciding which suspension I want to go. I'm really waiting for companies like Olin's to make their suspension because if theirs comes out and it's like 1500 or so, I'm going Olin's because come on now. You don't know who they are. Do some research. But other than that, everything is going great. I haven't gotten to the point of adding wheels yet. I keep going back and forth. The top wheel that I want that's on the top of the pile is not wavering. It's the Desmond Riga Masters. Now, in my practical sense, thinking of how much things cost and money, I'm not made out of money. There's a side of me that's like, okay, what's an alternative that's a little bit more, that's a little bit inexpensive? So I've been looking at NK and Koenig. You know, just to throw out some variations because the wheels, the true wheels, I mean, we're talking about $3,000 for a set, not even accounting for tires. So it's, it's big boy time when we get to that. One of those wheels is coming. I don't know which one yet, but very soon. Winter's coming. We don't really have winter where I live, so it doesn't really matter about stopping and putting your car away. Not that I would anyways. It's all wheel drive. Bring the snow on because I'm going to find a parking lot and have some fun. And that's it. Truly a short one today because there wasn't a, no bombarding of news and stuff that was going out. It was pretty much cut and dry. But I'll be back with another one. I might, you know, spin it up. There's a side of me that wants to do this twice a week. There's another side of my brain that says you don't have the time to do that. So stop playing yourself. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to see what happens. But as I say, do as you wish and do as you may. It's Cameron Biggs, your host, and this is Car Quiz. Peace.